Your presence is no longer needed. Really? How long do you plan to stay here? Leave this house quickly. You incompetent leech living off the money Steve left behind. Disappear. You're in the way. What? Can I really leave? Won't you regret this later? Of course. Don't make me repeat myself. I am Emma, 34 years old, working in the medical field. I met my husband, Steve, a 37-year-old surgeon, two years ago at the hospital we both worked at, and we got married. Upon marrying, I quit my job to focus on being a homemaker, as per my husband's wish. Currently, I am five months pregnant and suffering from severe morning sickness. My husband is a respected surgeon, admired by his peers for his skill. He is kind, gentle, and loved by patients and hospital staff alike. Our marriage is strong, and he is incredibly supportive, actively helping with household chores without a single complaint. Despite his demanding job, his dedication to our family is something I am deeply grateful for. The only concern I have is related to my in-laws. Hey, Emma, I have a request. I'd like to live with my parents and my sister Abby. My dad needs care and I want to support them as much as possible. It will also reduce the burden on my mom. Plus, with a baby on the way, having extra hands will be helpful for you, and it might make it easier for you to return to work. What do you think? That sounds good to me. I'm okay with it. Steve's family is kind, and if I can help take care of your father, it will lighten the load on your mom and Abby. Thank you, Emma. That means a lot to me. My mother-in-law has always been kind to me, and my sister-in-law Abby left a good impression during our family's meeting and our wedding, so I was confident we could build a good relationship. Thus, upon getting married, I started living with my in-laws and sister-in-law Abby. However, this shared living situation would soon change my life. One day, not long after we started living together, I was lying in bed in my room, still suffering from severe morning sickness, when I was called to the living room by my mother-in-law. My husband had left for work early in the morning, and my father-in-law was resting in another room, so it was just me, my mother-in-law, and sister-in-law Abby in the living room. My mother-in-law, usually calm, looked stern. Feeling tense, she suddenly spoke up. Emma, you're hardly managing the household chores and yet you're lazing around in bed? Since you're not paying rent, I want you to contribute $5,000 to the household every month. This was the start of an incomprehensible discussion. I'm sorry, I've been suffering from continuous morning sickness and have hardly been able to get out of bed. I feel terrible for relying so much on you and Abby for household chores, but I thought I was contributing enough each month. Well, Enough. You think a mere $2,000 is enough. We're letting you live here because we thought you'd help with the housework and take care of our father. You're not helping at all. Why did my son even choose someone like you as his wife? There's no need to say something so harsh. When I was young, regardless of morning sickness or anything else, I dedicated myself to my new family. You need to put in more effort. And I'm tired of taking care of that man. That's why I suggested to Steve that we all live together. Steve is a doctor, so $5,000 a month shouldn't be a big deal, right? Well then, I'm counting on you. We're going out for a bit, so take care of the housework and take care of our father. Useless sister-in-law. Saying this, the two of them left. I was shocked by their sudden change of attitude, as I thought we were getting along well. Despite not feeling well, I couldn't just sit around. So, I managed to suppress my discomfort from the morning sickness and started cleaning, doing laundry, and preparing meals for my father-in-law. My father-in-law, though unable to move his lower body, did not show signs of dementia and communicated well. He seemed to feel guilty about me taking care of everything alone, especially considering my pregnancy. I'm truly sorry that you have to take on everything, Emma. Considering the baby and your own health, I wish it wasn't so burdensome for you. It's okay. Steve is very supportive, so I don't feel burdened at all. Besides, I enjoy the time I spend talking with you. I'm really grateful, my father-in-law said, tears welling up in his eyes, expressing his gratitude. That evening, when my husband returned home, I told him about the demand from my mother-in-law and Abby for a monthly contribution of $5,000. However, I didn't mention their change in attitude, not wanting to worry him. $5,000, huh? Understood. Well, we are living here and my parents are living on their pension. Abby also has a regular work and doesn't have a stable income. My husband agreed to the monthly payment of $5,000 without hesitation, understanding the situation. Since my husband was okay with it, I reluctantly agreed as well. Then, one day, I received a call that my husband had collapsed at the hospital while at work. 
Worried sick, I managed to calm my panic enough to find out which hospital he was taken to, and immediately called a taxi to rush there. Steve was already unconscious during the transport and tears threatened to spill in the taxi. My mind was filled with pessimistic thoughts, hoping against hope that he would be okay. But, despite my wishes, Steve passed away shortly after we arrived at the hospital from an acute heart attack. He had left the house that morning with his usual kind smile, making it hard to accept the reality. Steve was only 37 years old. He had his whole life ahead of him, passionate about his work and excited to become a father soon. The thought of not being able to introduce our child to his or her father left me sobbing beside his body. Time passed, and my mother-in-law and Abby arrived at the hospital. My father-in-law had to stay home so a helper was arranged urgently. Oh, I can't believe this. My dear Steve. Why a heart attack? Really? This is all Emma's fault. Emma. If you had noticed Steve's health issues sooner, this tragedy wouldn't have happened. You're a disaster. Mom is right. The reason my brother died is because you came into our house. I'll never forgive you for taking him away. I'm truly sorry. Having just lost my husband, my heart was too broken to argue with them. I could only apologize. Maybe it was all my fault. If only I had noticed something was wrong with Steve sooner, he might still be alive. I was tormented by this thought for a while. Eventually, the funeral was held. Many of Steve's friends and colleagues came to say their goodbyes. I felt a profound loss and sorrow from the respect people had for my husband. But I knew I couldn't grieve forever. I have to become stronger for the sake of our child that's about to be born. I resolved. However, my resolve was quickly shattered by my in-law's words. Look, Emma. Just because Steve has passed away doesn't mean you're thinking of going back to your parents' house, right? Uh, well. I'm expecting soon, and the morning sickness hasn't ended, so I might return to my parents' house a bit earlier. What? If you go back to your parents, what will happen to the daily routine here? Who will take care of dad? You think you can just leave irresponsibly just because my brother died? As for taking care of dad, hiring a helper could lessen the burden. Hiring a helper? What are you thinking? As long as you're here, there's no need for outside help. That's a waste of money. Angered by their words, I responded, May I remind you, my mother-in-law is almost always home and Abby only works three days a week on a non-regular basis. Aren't you two perfectly capable of handling the household and taking care of dad? My mother-in-law retorted, I'm busy with community activities and hobbies. I don't have time to do housework, let alone care for him. She spends her time at home just watching TV and lounging around, using any excuse to shift all responsibility onto me. On my days off from my part-time job, I'm busy looking for a marriage partner. I can't spare any effort or money on beauty treatments to find a handsome, high-earning man. Oh, I just don't have enough time. Unlike you, who can stay home all day? Abby, significantly overweight and far from the beauty ideal she claimed, bafflingly exuded confidence from nowhere. And Emma, it's not an exaggeration to say Steve's death is your fault. So, you'll continue to take care of the household and dad and will also need the same $5,000 a month for living expenses. We've heard about the savings Steve left behind, so paying shouldn't be an issue, right? But, I don't have an income right now, and with the baby coming, expenses will increase. I wanted to save Steve's money for our child's future. Oh, but is that child really Steve's? Could it be someone else's? That's really funny. Really? Emma, you're so vulgar. Then it's even more unthinkable to use Steve's money for a child that might not be his. Please wait. This child is indeed Steve's. It's terrible to say such things. But realizing arguing was futile, I gave up on going back to my parents and resigned myself to contributing $5,000 a month for living expenses, continuing the household chores and caring for my father-in-law. It seems excessive for a family of four to need that much, especially with pension income. Though I have some savings, I didn't want to dip into the inheritance Steve left, preferring to save it for our child's future. Moreover, returning to my parents would leave my father-in-law without proper care. If help or support isn't an option, going back isn't either. Ah, uh, my belly is getting heavier and it's stuff, but it seems like I have no choice but to handle the household chores and caregiving on my own. I managed the household and caregiving tasks as best as I could, using delivery services for grocery shopping to keep it unnoticed by my mother-in-law and Abby. One day, while preparing a meal for my father-in-law, an incident occurred. 
Hey, Emma, can I talk to you for a moment? There's something I need to tell you. Yes, what is it? At that moment, my mother-in-law and Abby were out, and it was just my father-in-law and me at home. I wanted to tell you something while they're not around. Please listen to this. He handed me a voice recorder, and the moment I press play, I was shocked. Is this? My mother-in-law and Abby's voices? What are they saying? I can't believe this. I heard a conversation between my mother-in-law and Abby. I felt a growing outrage towards them, and it felt like something inside me broke. Inforgivable, absolutely not. From there, my father-in-law and I devised a plan, and I was determined to carry it out. We waited for the night to come. When my mother-in-law and Abby returned home happily, I made them an offer. Mother, Abby, as a token of my gratitude, how about a trip just for the two of you? Of course, my father-in-law and I will stay here. A trip. Wonderful. I want it to be abroad. Emma, that's a great idea. How about inviting two friends and all of us going to Europe? Of course, it's fine to invite your friends. Why don't you take a little break for about two weeks? Emma, you do come up with good suggestions sometimes. The thought of getting away from this depressing daughter-in-law and that old man, what an expected happiness. As a result, they planned a two-week trip to Europe, including their friends, one month later, without suspecting our plan. Then, the day of their trip arrived. After seeing off the two who left in high spirits, I immediately started preparing to leave this home. Being in the later stages of pregnancy and unable to carry heavy items, I called my mother to help me. After telling my parents everything, they expressed their anger towards my mother-in-law and Abby but warmly welcomed me to come back home. Then, after completing the moving preparations, I expressed my gratitude to my father-in-law. Though it was for a short time, I am very grateful for your care. After Steve passed away, you were the only one who always spoke to me with warmth. I am the one who should be grateful, Emma, for your caregiving. I'll be living in a care facility from now on, so don't worry. All that's left is to wait for those two to receive their just desserts. Two weeks passed, and the day they returned from their trip came. While I was peacefully staying at my parents' house, my phone rang. My mother-in-law's name appeared on the screen. When I answered, she demanded I return home immediately, so I reluctantly agreed. Welcome back, mother. Did you enjoy your trip to Europe? Enjoyed it? That's not the point, Emma. We were happy to go on the trip you gifted us, but why are we being billed for it? There's a bill for $20,000. I thought it was lucky it only came to $20,000 for four of you. I was expecting it to easily exceed $30,000 with such luxurious accommodations. What are you talking about? Boyfriend? We just invited some friends from the neighborhood, and it was just the four of us. Oh. Is that so? But I have evidence here. Please have a look at the envelope on the living room table. My mother-in-law and Abby were then confronted with a report from a detective. What is this? You tricked us by hiring a detective, you sly woman. No, it wasn't me who hired the detective. It was my father-in-law. What dad did? Yes, it was actually my father-in-law who had requested the investigation. One day, he grew suspicious of my mother-in-law and Abby's behavior and installed a hidden microphone in the living room to eavesdrop on their conversations. Listen, mom. Last night, I went on a date with a charming man who earns over a million a year. He's married, but he showed a lot of interest in me and came on to me strongly. I ended up not coming home until morning. I'll make him divorce his wife and take him for myself. That's wonderful, Abby. Go ahead and get that man for yourself. I also hope my wealthy lover will divorce his spouse soon and become mine alone. Then, eventually, we'll leave this place and start a luxurious life. In fact, they were involved with married men and planning to leave my father-in-law behind and move out of the house. Furious with this revelation, my father-in-law and I planned the trip as a strategy. He expected them to bring their affairs along on the trip and hired a detective to investigate during their absence. 
The investigation revealed that the friends accompanying my M, other in law and Abby on the trip were, in fact, their extramarital lovers. Well, now that it's out, there's nothing else to do but to give up. I'm going to divorce your father and kick that man out of the house. And you, Emma, are no longer needed here. Really? How long do you plan to stay? Leave this house immediately. Leave, you worthless person living off the money Steve left behind. What? Can I really leave? Won't you regret this later? Of course. Don't make me repeat myself. Also, regarding the cost of the trip, you will be bearing it yourself. While I suggested the trip, I never mentioned it would be a gift. Humph, if it's about $20,000, I'll just have my wealthy lover pay for it. Is that so? Additionally, my father-in-law has already moved to a facility. Thank you for everything. Goodbye, and please do as you wish. Thus, I returned to my parents' home, feeling refreshed. After spending some peaceful time at home, one day, my mother-in-law and Abby unexpectedly showed up at the entrance. Emma, we apologize for our behavior up to now. Please, come back, sister. I sincerely apologize for everything I've said and done. We really want you back. Oh, what brings both of you here? Why has it come to this? Our relationships outside were exposed, and the spouses are demanding a large compensation from us. I live on a pension, and Abby is in a regular employment with little savings. We don't know how to handle this. In fact, my father-in-law had sent the detective's report to the families of the lovers, resulting in a massive demand for compensation from them. Additionally, they were being sued for compensation for infidelity by my father-in-law as well. Moreover, we haven't settled the $20,000 for the trip yet. Could you possibly share Steve's inheritance with us? I categorically refuse. You treated me like a servant all this time. I cannot forgive you. Besides, the monthly living expenses of $5,000 were being paid out of my own savings, not from Steve's inheritance. What? You had that much in savings? I thought you worked in medical administration at a hospital. No, my daughter is a distinguished doctor at our hospital. My father, who is the director of a large hospital, appeared and informed them of the reality. Yes, I am his daughter and was working as a surgeon, recognized for my achievements and expected to succeed him as the director of the hospital. Steve and I were united by a romance that began at the same workplace. Recognizing the situation, my mother-in-law said, then, all the more reason we want you to come back, Emma, the future director of the hospital, please save us from our plight. We're going to suffer under debt. Please help us. Sister-in-law, they pleaded with tears. However, I firmly refused and securely locked the door. The commotion led to a neighbor calling the police and they were eventually taken away in a police car. Later, my mother-in-law and Abby were demanded to pay compensation by the spouses of their lovers. My mother-in-law also had to pay compensation to my father-in-law. They were also reminded to pay for the trip, resulting in significant debt. The scandal spread throughout the neighborhood, forcing them to move. They now live in a small apartment, juggling multiple jobs to pay off their debts. A deserved outcome. As for my father-in-law, his divorce was successfully finalized, and he enjoys a stress-free life in a care facility. As for me, I safely gave birth to a girl and am living a fulfilling life with the support of my parents. Next month, I plan to return to work, placing my daughter in daycare. I intend to carry on Steve's legacy, moving forward as both a doctor and a mother. My son, who earns a high income, and you, who spend every day without working, are not compatible. My son and I are planning to live here from now on, so please leave immediately. It happened on a day when my husband, who usually stays in his room, had gone out for a bit. Suddenly, the intercom at my house buzzed incessantly, and when I opened the door, my mother-in-law was standing there, looking excited, taken aback by this sudden visit. I asked, hello, mother-in-law, 
What brings you here at this time? Before anything, answer the intercom immediately when it rings. Making me wait is quite rude, don't you think? I'm sorry, I was a bit tied up with work. Work? It's hard to believe you do any real work at home. I bet you're just lazing around, aren't you? That's not true. I'm genuinely working. I don't want to hear excuses. You live a comfortable life here every day, yet benefit from my son's high salary. I think it's unfair. We intend to start a new life here, just my son and I. Could you find somewhere else to go? She pulled out a piece of paper from an envelope she was holding and handed it to me with a smug smile. Here, take a look. The paper read divorce papers. Moreover, my husband's section was already filled out. Wait, are these divorce papers? Yes. He's also come to realize he can't be with you any longer. So, sign this and leave this place immediately. She looked incredibly proud of herself, perhaps relishing the shock she imagined I'd be in. But I wasn't as flustered as she thought. With a slight smile, I promptly signed the divorce papers. Inwardly, I couldn't help but chuckle at how much she misunderstood. She didn't know anything. My name is Nancy. I work from home, hustling as a freelance writer and editor. I used to work for a publishing company, so I've leveraged that experience to maintain a stable income even now. While working at the publishing company, it wasn't uncommon to work late into the night or even on weekends. But the compensation was good, and thanks to my salary, bonuses, and copyright-related rewards from the publishing world, I managed to save a considerable amount. Thanks to that, despite the instability of freelancing, I've been able to live comfortably. I met my husband, Dylan, while working together at the publishing company. He was an aspiring writer, chasing his dreams, and I supported and resonated with his passion. Gradually, my feelings of appreciation turned into love, leading to our marriage. Initially, our married life was fulfilling as we supported each other's careers. Upon getting married, I started freelancing, switching to working from home. Until then, I believed both my husband and in-laws understood and appreciated my career and income. However, as time passed, it seemed their misunderstandings about my work grew. My in-laws held traditional values. In their generation, the concept of working from home wasn't common. They also perceived freelancing as unstable, especially compared to my husband's regular employment, and thus devalued my work. Additionally, Dylan began telling his parents how successful he had become as a renowned writer. Because of this, the cold attitude of my in-laws towards me intensified. Every time we met, they'd sarcastically say things like, Oh, look, it's Nancy who doesn't seem to work much. What brings you here today? Looking for a job recommendation? Mother-in-law, if you're concerned about our living expenses, I apologize, but I'm earning well, so there's no need to worry. Well, you sound quite confident. Maybe you should show more gratitude to Dylan. Without him, you'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? My mother-in-law had old-fashioned values. In her generation, women typically managed the household while men worked outside. Thus, seeing me work from home, she likely assumed I was shirking housework. The story paints a picture of generational and cultural differences, misunderstandings, and challenges within a family. Mother-in-law, freelancing means that you can earn a good income even without going to an office and working from home. Nowadays, with technological advancements, we can work from anywhere, and my job falls into that category. However, my mother-in-law responded angrily, all you do is talk back. You're such an unpleasant daughter-in-law. It just doesn't look natural for a young woman to be messing around with a computer at home all day. Lately, these kinds of conversations had been recurring, and I was honestly getting a bit tired of it. I swallowed down my retort, thinking, not this topic again. Inwardly, I thought, in reality, I'm the main breadwinner, and I handle most of the housework, but I didn't say it out loud. In the beginning, her occasional complaints only occurred when Dylan wasn't around, but recently, she's been saying them more openly, especially during family dinners at her house, which felt more like a session to criticize me than anything else. 
Despite being invited, only Dylan's portion of food would be on the table. There was no seat for me, making it very uncomfortable. Moreover, she seemed to badmouth me to other relatives, and I could hear whispered comments, which were very unpleasant. I was often taken aback by her and my father-in-law's attitudes, but Dylan's silence also irritated me. On top of that, they saw Dylan as a successful author and relied on him for money, often asking him to buy things. This was funded by the money I earned. Initially, it was a small amount, but lately, I noticed we were spending almost $2,000 monthly for his parents. I decided to tell Dylan, I want you to stop giving my earnings to your parents without asking me. But his response was colder than I expected. You're earning money while relaxing at home, right? It's easy money, so why not let my parents use a bit of it? Wait, Dylan, do you really think I'm just lounging around at home to earn my money? I couldn't hide my shock at his words. It felt like the last straw. I felt betrayed, confused, and sad. Even though there were challenges with his parents and our differing backgrounds, I believed Dylan was on my side, which helped me persevere. That reassurance was shattered by his words. Dylan, who I thought understood my feelings and efforts, ended up joining those who mocked me behind my back. I remembered our first date when he passionately talked about his work, shared dreams, and values. I was drawn to his enthusiasm and sincerity. But lately, he seemed to have forgotten his dreams and passion and spent his days aimlessly, often engrossed in games. And that figure was completely different from the person he was when we first met. Games aren't bad in themselves, but his obsession made him neglect his passion for writing, which saddened and angered me. I started questioning if I should continue my future with Dylan. If my relationship with Dylan continued, what would become of my life? Even when I tried to imagine a future with him, I could only see a bleak future. Thus, I decided to divorce him and secretly began looking for a new place to live. I searched online for apartments suitable for singles and visited a few properties for viewing. Focusing on apartments with a quiet living environment and strong security, I finally decided on one property. One day, while Dylan, who usually played games in his room, was out, my mother-in-law visited. Surprised by her sudden visit, I opened the door. Without waiting, she sat on the living room sofa and bluntly said, Nancy, you should leave this place. What are you saying all of a sudden? I was too shocked to respond. Isn't it obvious? You're bad at housework. And even after Dylan became a popular author, you haven't changed. Above all, you can't even work properly. But I've told you many times that it's a misunderstanding. Haven't I? However, my mother-in-law interrupted me, smiling gently. I plan to live here and support Dylan. Taking care of him is much better than looking after that noisy old lady. By noisy old lady, do you mean Dylan's grandmother? Yes, that woman who is technically my mother-in-law. Even though I've done so much for her, she always finds fault. She shows no gratitude and I'm fed up. If I live here, I can take care of Dylan and he can focus on his work without any hindrance. Isn't that wonderful? With that, she pulled out a piece of paper from the envelope she held. So, would you please leave this house immediately? As I listened to her words, I accepted the divorce papers she held out. They had been signed by Dylan. Did Dylan really sign this? A little while ago, I suggested to Dylan that it might be better for both of you to get a divorce. It seems he was fed up with you two because he signed it without hesitation, she said with a playful tone. Everything that followed happened so quickly. I took my pre-packed bags and promptly decided to move to a new apartment. During the move, I also managed to file the divorce papers, and a new life began. My new life was more smooth and comfortable than I had expected. My small apartment had only essential furniture and appliances, and its simplicity seemed to boost my focus. I was free from complications, and each day was calm and peaceful. I'd wake up to natural light streaming in through the window and the sound of birds chirping in the distance. I would get up whenever I wanted, eat breakfast, and plan my day. When I start working, I get so engrossed that time would fly by. 
It felt heavenly not having to worry about the gaze and expectations of Dylan and my parents-in-laws, and to be able to work at my own pace. One day, as I was engrossed in work at my desk, my smartphone vibrated. It was a call from Dylan. I hesitated but decided to answer. Nancy, please come back right now. A desperate Dylan pleaded. Why would you want me to come back all of a sudden? To be honest, my parents found out I lied about being a popular author. I'm under immense pressure now. They're even talking about moving in, expecting to live off my earnings. So, please, can you come back? I see, but returning isn't that simple. You chose to sign the divorce papers, didn't you? So did I. We're not on the same path anymore. So deal with your issues yourself. It's none of my business. His voice was a mix of desperation and sadness. But I believe we should be together. Please come back. Firmly, I responded, we've chosen different lives now. I could hear Dylan taking a deep breath on the other end. I understand, but since the divorce, there have been many troubles, and it's costing me a lot. I need assistance with expenses like the care fees for our parents and compensations for the chaos it caused. Why are you suddenly talking about this? I think your decisions played a part in ruining all of my plans. How dare you? Remember when we were married how you and your parents mocked me? I didn't want to say this, but now you seem like an enemy. Your financial troubles arise because you don't work properly. Find another way to sort it out. I wish you wouldn't rely on me for everything. With that, I ended the call. Despite numerous subsequent calls from Dylan, I blocked him and changed my number. A few months later, I happened to pass by where his house used to be. Instead of his house, there was now just an empty land. A nearby resident told me about the recent disputes at his place, with police getting involved at times. The neighbor's words seemed to contain all the emotions of the situation. As she said, you must have gone through a lot too. There must have been a lot of turmoil leading to the loss of his house. I stood there for a while, reflecting on our past. The unexpected outcome might be some kind of karma. Dylan's little lie had had such a significant impact, more unbelievable than any story he might have written. From then on, I pledged to myself to live honestly, expressing my feelings and thoughts without lies or pretense. No matter how challenging things get, I recognized the importance of conveying the truth and cherishing genuine feelings.